We very much appreciate it. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, the goal of this panel is to discuss the 2012 candidate elections. And I know many of you are thinking to yourself, you know, I haven't heard, heard nearly enough about the 2012 campaigns yet. <laughs> there's no news coverage, there's no advertising. I'm thirsting for information. And for those of you who've just returned from another planet, well, you've come to the right place because we have four experts here to fill you in. And for those of you, in all seriousness, who do feel inundated by the news and information and opinion that has gotten to be a little bit overwhelming in recent weeks, uh, we're very fortunate today to have four of the state's foremost uh, political experts to help us sift through all of that noise and come to, I think, a, a much better understanding um, of the various uh, uh, of the various challenges we're going to face on our ballot in early November. Uh, the biographies of each of our panelists are already uh, in the journal we've been provided, so I'm just going to make very brief introductions so that we have more time for questions from all of you. Uh, sitting uh, immediately to my left is Dick Kastner. Dick is the Western Regional Director of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Next to Dick is Paul Mitchell, uh, and Paul's the President of our Districting Partners and the Vice President of Political Data Incorporated and uh, we'll talk more about redistricting reform, I uh, predict a little bit later, uh, but Paul is one of the main reasons there are so many competitive races in California <laughs> this year. So thank you, Paul, so much for all the mail and television commercials. Absolutely. We appreciate it. Um, and down at the far end of the panel uh, are, are two of the state's uh, not only most recognizable but smartest political, political operatives and analysts, uh, Gary South representing, uh, from California Strategies, LLC, and Rob Stutzman, the president of Stutzman Public Affairs. So let's, uh, let's give our panel uh, a round of applause in advance. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to give each of the panelists a couple of minutes to, to make an opening statement to get things started. And then I'll take moderator's prerogative with just a couple of questions before we open it up to make sure as many of you get uh, time for questions to our experts. Um, our panelists have been told in advance that they do get two to three minutes for an introduction. Um, I've been briefed with the Candy Crowley School of Panel Moderation guys, so let's, uh, so let's do our best to keep that two to three minute uh, overview to no more than eight or ten minutes uh, piece. Um, Dick, why don't, uh, why don't you get us started uh, representing the U.S. Chamber? Talk a little bit about what you and your organization see uh, ahead of us over the next few weeks and in, 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 in what it means. Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, first, wow, two to three minutes. Uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is the world's largest business federation. We are also uh, rather, you heard the U.S. in the title, we are totally focused on federal races. Um, and, uh, and we really don't do much on the congressional, so it's all House and Senate related. Um, I, I would rather talk about what we do so you'll understand that uh, and leave time during the questions for handicapping races because to do all that now means why bother with the questions? So um, uh, what we do, first and foremost, is try to elect more people who will vote for economic growth, economic activity, jobs, business, and so forth. And um, we have a yardstick that we measure candidates by. Uh, it's this, uh, how they voted. Uh, we publish this every year, and um, it basically is to keep track of the most important issues uh, that come to the House and Senate floors and how members individually vote. And for members of Congress that vote with us 70 or more percent of the time and don't have, you know, issues in their closet that we don't want to talk about, they get an endorsement automatically, pretty much. We call them friends of business. Uh, for members of Congress who have records 40 or less per, uh, percent of the time voting with us, um, we try to recruit candidates to beat them. We'd like to see people uh, who do better. Uh, by our standards, and um, we work darned hard in competitive districts to, uh, to elect those folks. Um, I've read uh, several places in the last month or so that we are the second largest spender uh, this election cycle in congressional races, so it must be true. Um, we certainly are spending more than we did uh, two years ago. And um, we're hoping it's going to do some good for our endorsed candidates. But um, uh, basically, we endorse candidates that we think are business oriented. We spend a boatload of money in races where we think it'll make a difference in the outcome. Um, and um, 
again, I'll leave the handicapping of races until uh, a little later. Uh, happy to talk about um, uh, where we think the competitive races are and how they're shaping up. Um, it is, though, interestingly, the first time in literally a couple of decades that we've been paying attention to California. Um, I, 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 Paul knows this, but uh, let's face it, congressionally, um, this has been a backwater, to put it mildly. Um, 53 congressional districts. We've had five elections under the old lines. The people who drew them with an eye toward in protecting incumbents, uh, they were spectacularly successful. Uh, 53 elections times five, that's 265 general elections. One seat changed hands um, from one party to the other out of 265 elections. I'd say they accomplished what they set out to do. Um, that's not going to be the case now. Things have been mixed up a bit. Um, again, thank you, Paul. Um, I, ha I now have a job. <laughs> so um, uh, with that, thank you. Uh, before we go to Paul, just one other uh, uh, quick point uh, I, I need to make. In addition to Darnell and uh, uh, his colleagues at NBC Universal and the gratitude we have to them for sponsoring today's panel, uh, I also want to make sure to thank both Southwest Airlines and Verizon for being our, our runway sponsors. And so, Paul, when, uh, when you flew down here on Southwest Airlines this mo morning, um, using your Verizon service to answer yeah, uh, email messages, uh, how, t tell us a little bit about uh, tell us a, l a little bit how it, uh, how you uh, decided to con configure today's conversation. Well, um, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, this should be a rather relaxed, mundane election cycle in California, given that we're not a swing state. The presidential race, I don't think, is really going to be decided in California. But being Californians, we decided not to go that route. We created three new reforms, uh, all back to back to back in California that have really shaken up our election system. We changed first off the way that we redraw lines through this redistricting reform, and I can go into that later. But essentially what that did was completely shook up the ant farm. Uh, it displaced many members of Congress, the legislature. To put it in perspective, uh, our redistricting in the past might move one or two legislators out of their districts as a function of having to you know, just unavoidable consequences of redistricting. In this uh, most recent redistricting, 60 incumbents out of 173 either found another member of, of, their, uh, of the legislature in their district or another congressman in their district, they found the lines moved out from underneath them, they found their entire base of voters moved to another district or some other negative consequence. That's the biggest shakeup in the country. Um, on top of redistricting reform, we also have a new structure for our elections with the open primary. Both of these were designed to create more competitiveness, draw more people into elections, make our elections meaningful again. And then being Californians, we created the first, created the second, and before we could even interpret what the outcome was from those two, we made those more permanent by extending term limits for the legislature so now people who get elected can serve 12 years in either house. So we've shaken up our structure, shaken up the process, and then made whatever comes about more permanent. Um, a fourth reform that I don't think anybody really had their eyes on but that is, is emerging is the change for online registration. Um, we've only had online registration, voter registration in this state for about three, three and a half weeks. And our estimate is that we're going to see 750,000 online registrations. And 80% of those are going to be new first-time registrants. They're going to be younger. And looking at the partisanship of these online registrants, just take Orange County as an example. Orange County has a five-point Republican advantage. These online registrations have shifted 30 points more Democratic than that. So it is an interesting last minute shake up to the system. So we've got redistricting, open primary, um, the term limit extension, new and unknown then factor of online registration. The, the idea was that this would create com competitiveness, and I can go into it, but I don't really think it did create long term competitiveness. It created Berman versus Sherman, it created one time crazy races that we don't know the outcomes of. So it created this year competitiveness, but does it mean that these districts? are going to be competitive in four or six or eight years? I don't think so. Um, it was also supposed to reduce partisanship. 
meaning that if you took away the primary structure, you'd, you'd take away some of the power of the parties, take away some of the power of the polar extremes of each party. And in our analysis, that didn't happen. It was also supposed to enliven or really build up the decline to states, that mushy middle of California politics, this, this undefined population that seems to be growing every year. And in our analysis, it didn't do that either. 37 no party preference candidates ran for the legislature or Congress. One won a second place. One was gifted a second place because there were only two candidates on the ballot. And the other 35 lost. So, and Nathan Fletcher ran for as a nonpartisan in San Diego as another one of these, you know, rise of the middle kind of candidates came in third. Uh, in addition, decline to state turnout in this primary was the lowest it's ever been. And looking at post-election analysis of some of these races, we found that decline to state voters were not voting in the partisan primaries. And the goal of, one of the goals of this nonpartisan or this uh, top two system, the open primary, was that you'd have Republicans in Santa Monica influencing to get the more moderate Democrat. And we found very little cross-party voting. And so a lot of these hopes and aspirations of redistricting and open primary don't seem to have borne fruit yet, and I'm happy to dig into any of those more deeply. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's worth coming back to that a little bit later because I think a lot of uh, of others have analyzed the results and said that particularly for top two primary, the real results come not after the June primary, but rather after the uh, the November general election. So we'll certainly see going forward. Gary, let's move on to you. Lots to sift through, both at the state and national level. But for just a few minute beginning, what's the most important thing to you to watch on the political landscape heading into the last couple of weeks of the campaign? Well, I want to, um, I actually want to say a few words about demographics in California, because I think it's, I wrote a piece for Huffington Post uh, a couple of months ago when the Republicans were complaining about the new lines that were drawn by the, in the, by the Citizens uh, Redistricting Commission. And the title of the piece was, it's demographics, not Democrats, that are the Republican problem in California. These are some astonishing statistics, and you have to put not only today's politics in California, but the future of politics in California into this context. If you look at the 2010 census, you all know there are 58 counties in California. Uh, between 2000 and 2010, 29, half of those counties, half of the counties in the state of California, grew their Latino population between 40% and 100%. 40% and 100%, half the counties in California, and only three of those counties touch the coast. All the rest of them are inland. Another 16 counties grew their, their Latino uh, population between 30 and 40 percent. Another seven between 20 and 30 percent. There's only one county in the state that lost Latino population. So Latinos grew by 28 percent in California between 2000 and 2010. But they weren't even the fastest growing minority group. That happened to be Asian Americans. Asian Americans between 2000 and 2010 grew by 31% in California. Fastest growing uh, uh, minority group. And if you put together Latinos and Asians, they're now over half of California. That doesn't even include blacks, who are another 7%. Now, why is that important? Because if you, cro if, as we say in politics and political polling, if you cross-tab that data with the following fact, from 1994 to 2010, the last general election we had, every Republican gubernatorial candidate and presidential candidate in California during that 16-year period of time, the average percentage of the Latino vote they received was 25%, 25%. And the average Asian American percentage they received was 37%. Now, Folks, you can't, I mean, if you're trying to be a viable political party in a state like California with that kind of a minority electorate, you can't survive if you're getting 25% of the largest ethnic group in California and 37% on average of the second largest minority group in California. And if you look at the Republican office holders currently in California, there are 19 members of the congressional delegation that are Republican. There's 15 members of the state Senate. There's 27 members of the 80 member assembly who are Republicans. That's 61 people, right? Among those 61 people, 
There's not a single Latino, there's not a single Asian, there's not a single black. So you talk about a disconnect between a party that's trying to be a major party and be competitive in this kind of a political environment and the reality on the ground here, both demographically and politically, um, the, 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 the disconnect is complete. And if you, if you look toward the future, it's, it's not good news. We all know that the Republicans are down to 30.1% of, 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 of registered voters. That's less than a third. That's an all-time historic low. But if you look at the Latino figures, there are places in California, the San Joaquin Valley, which is considered to be something that's Republican-leaning, at least in the last couple of decades. In the 2010 census, 51% of the San Joaquin Valley is now Latino, an absolute majority of the, of the, of the of the San Joaquin Valley. San Bernardino County and Riverside County, the Inland Empire, which are considered to be kind of Republican leaning, at least in state politics, 49% of, 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 of San Bernardino is now Latino and 46% of Riverside County is now Latino. So I mean, you, you don't have to be a statistician or mathematician to do the math here. What it means is, is that if you're the Republican Party in California and you cannot, you cannot appeal to, you cannot be competitive among Latinos and among, or even among Asian Americans, you have long-term survivability problems. And I'll talk more specifically about some of the particular races that are, that, are, that are on the ballot this year, but that's a demographic reality that I think business groups in particular have to take into account when you are looking at how you maneuver through the California political environment uh, you know, with, with the general view that Republicans tend to be more pro-business than Democrats, although that's not always true, but if, if that's the general overall view of business groups, you have a particular problem trying to figure out how to maneuver through and be viable and to be active in the political system in this state when it is tilting that heavily Democratic. Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, Rob is a longtime Republican strategist in the state. I'm assuming you're largely in agreement with everything Gary said, and we'll see the rest of your time back to him. <clears throat> well, Gary, I always, Gary talks a lot about my party. Um, his has a few problems as well, but I do, uh, I do concur. There's a demographic problem that, that faces California or Republicans in California. The good news is, is that <clears throat> the redistricting uh, creates more competitive seats and forces Republicans to learn how to go win in some of these areas that Gary is talking about. One of the problems for Republicans has been these gerrymandered seats, where all you have to worry about is, uh, is the primary, which means you're moving, all you're worried about is being able to outright wing whoever might run against you in that primary, and that has contributed significantly to, uh, to my party's problems. But I'd, I'd like to talk about, come back and, and use my, my time to offer a few remarks on the reforms that, that Paul um, introduced us to. The, <clears throat> specifically the new open primary, really the, the, the name on this to emphasize is top two runoff, because I think that's the most interesting and significant reform. There are 29 intra-party runoffs between Congressional, Senate, and Assembly that are on the ballot in November. Um, I imagine registrars got a lot of calls in those, where those races lie about a week ago when absentee ballots arrived and Republicans in a double D runoff was wondering why they were given the wrong ballot or, or vice versa. <laughs> Where's the person from my party to, to vote for? Uh, this, I don't know what to make of this as a reform, whether it's good or bad, but it's extremely interesting. And I, whereas I, I agree, the, the whole notion that somehow an open primary was going to involve independents and make them a, a significant voice in June, it was going to happen. I'm very skeptical it will ever happen. Um, we are, this is the third June primary in a row where we've had extremely low turnout. People that are coming out to vote in June primaries are extreme part or partisan voters, and they're going to vote on a part in a partisan level. So your primaries really don't change. Independents, by their nature, aren't all that politically involved because they're indifferent to joining a political party, and they don't play in the semifinals. They just want to participate in the finals in November. I think it's a lot of the psychology in general of a DTS voter. So you're still going to get these very partisan. I think uh, primaries. Now the gamemans, gamesmanship there is the size of the field. And just to give you an example, in the Attorney General's race two years ago, there were seven Democrats and three Republicans. If that happens again in two years and there were 
two Republicans and seven Democrats. Probably the runoff would be between the two Republicans for Attorney General. Because, you, because you know, it's the math, right? The, the seven Democrats would defuse the, the Democrat partisan vote. So this is an unpredictable factor. Size of the fields matter. It provides opportunity for mischief and gaming and making sure people are filed and all that type of thing. But as you get to this, uh, this intra-party runoff, um, what I think is interesting about it, and I, I think is a positive thing, is that you have, for instance, Santa Monica, well, you know, the Santa Monica was raised. Well, there's, a, there's an assembly runoff in Santa Monica uh, in West LA between two Democrats, an incumbent member of the legislature, Betsy Butler, and the, the mayor of Santa Monica, Richard Bloom. Uh, two pretty liberal Democrats. But uh, Republicans are getting talked to a lot in that district. I mean, Sherman Berman, I think they're taking Republican voters out to steak dinners, I think. So, you know, it, it, it gives franchise to voters that otherwise are irrelevant. And their choices, sure, are between uh, two, two liberal Democrats, but that's the reflection of the community they live in. But at least they really have a real voice in selecting who it is that may go uh, to, to represent them. Same would be true, I'll give you another example, in, in Orange County, a race that I'm involved in, the 72nd North Orange County, conservative district, two Republicans in a runoff. Democrats there are getting talked to. They're not used to that uh, if they're a Democrat in Orange County. What, you know, will the effect of this be to moderate the legislature? I don't, I don't know. I'm not going to pretend to predict that. But it, it is a change. It changes where money flows. Um, uh, it, it changes the way to think about recruiting candidates. It changes the invincibility of, of a legislator that is in quote unquote a safe district because they may not be safe to a challenge from their own party that goes all the way to November where it's a forced choice for Republicans to, to, to choose one or the other. And by the way, it would be, it, this will be interesting to go back and look at, but the research that we've done uh, I work, I've been working with Jobs Pack, which is the Chamber of Commerce's bipartisan effort to elect, frankly, Republicans in swing seats and then more moderate business-friendly Democrats in Democrat seats, is that people are completely unaware of this top two runoff. And so the question is, you know, well, what will a Democrat do when faced with two Republicans or vice versa? Because, you know, their mother might roll over in their grave if they ever knew I voted for a Republican. The undervote it would appear is only going to, I think, be in like this 25, 30% range. And because people want to participate. They don't want to just give up their vote. And uh, basically they'll be motivated to vote for what they think are the lesser of the two evils or vote against the greater of the two evils as it may be. Um, anyway, so all lots of interesting things to watch. A lot of it obviously is happening right here in the Valley um, on the big stage of, of Berman, uh, Berman Sherman. By the way, tell me if I'm wrong, but if, I assume most of you have seen the video of the big, you know, stare down. Okay, Jack Lemon, Walter Matthau, right? <laughs> Grumpy Men 3, that's the way it should have been cast. God rest their souls, but that's all I could think about. So. <laughs> okay, I'm going to uh, ask a round of questions to our panelists and then open it up uh, for all of you two. And I'll ask the panelists, because my questions won't be that good, to give them relatively brief answers so we can get as much input from our uh, uh, from our hosts here today. Um, Paul, I'm going to start with you. And I want to go back, uh, build on the point that, uh, that Rob was making, and go back to your thoughts uh, on top two primary. I'm going to offer you a county th counter theory on top two primary, and I want you to tell me why I'm wrong, OK? So rather than measuring the success of top two primary by how many declined to, sta declined to state candidates won primaries in, in June, is it reasonable instead to look at the 30th congressional district race between two longtime Democrats who are making an effort to talk not just to the base of their own party, but to talk to independents and to Republicans in order to try to form a governing coalition. Is it reasonable to look at the 31st congressional district a bit further east and look at uh, Bob Dutton and Gary Miller, two longtime conservative Republicans, competing not just for conservative Republican votes, but for independents and Democrats? Is there not some benefit in creating a set of incentives for candidates for legislative and congressional office to talk to voters beyond the ideological base of their own party. You know, that's the theory of, one of the theory of theories around the open primary is that it'll allow that to happen, allow that discussion to happen. Uh, my two thoughts on it. First off, um, uh, I'm a big USC fan. 
right? I went to SC, I go, I watch, I watch college football until USC loses a game and then I stop watching. But if it was, uh, if it was the Rose Bowl and it was UCLA versus UCLA, would I care who won? I mean, there's just nothing there for me. And so if I'm a Republican in a Dem on Dem race, the question is, what are voters going to do in those races? Now, the SAC B just came out at, and in opposition two years after the fact or a few years after the fact um, of <coughs> in opposition to Prop 14 and the open primary because it said that it robs big chunks of the electorate of actual choices in their election because now instead of being able to vote for somebody who is for the war in Iraq, they have no choice. Instead of trying to vote for somebody who's opposed to gay marriage, they have no choice. So you've robbed the electorate of actual meaningful choices and in lieu given them a choice of UCLA squad A versus UCLA squad B. Um, the second thing is that while it's something that's interesting to talk about, what we have to see in order for that to actually be borne out is that voters are crossing over and voting in the other race or voting for the two Democrats or the two Republicans. And in the primary, our analysis of a number of races show that that wasn't happening. If you do in uh, the Senate race between Joe Cotto and um, Jim Bell up in, Santa, in San Jose, it was two Democrats on the ballot, no other candidates. And if you plot every precinct in that district and draw a line for how many Republicans are in that precinct, and then do another graph of every precinct in the district and how many undervotes there were, meaning people who just didn't vote in that race, that line and the line of Republicans is like identical. There's a direct correlation in those districts that had two Dems or two Reaps that the Republicans in Dem on Dem races just weren't voting and the Dems in Reap on Reap races were just not voting. So your argument would be more, more uh, it would be stronger if we actually see from this general election that people in the Berman Sherman do pick a candidate or in the Santa Monica assembly race. My joke has always been that in the Santa Monica assembly race, you have a pro-environment, pro-gay marriage, um, Democrat backed by a labor union, or the liberal. <laughs> okay, so the, if Republicans become active in that race, then your argument would have legs. But in the primary, that wasn't borne out. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, Post-election, Stuart, if you're listening, Paul and I will be happy to come back and debate redistricting top two primary and term limits reform, and I'll be happy to explain to you guys in greater detail while he's wrong. But I'm the moderator today, so I can't do that, so we'll go on. <laughs> I'm willing to. <laughs> go for it. Rob? Well, I, I, I don't think Paul's wrong, but I do have a different, <laughs> a, a bit of a different perspective. It, it, camp it's still incumbent upon campaigns to campaign. And, and as I think we've, we've acknowledged, these, it did not, the phenomena did not happen in the primary except where you have a circumstance where you can capitalize on it. 69th Assembly District, Orange County, Tom Daly, moderate Democrat, <clears throat> who had a base. He had been the mayor of Anaheim, had Republican voters in that community that knew him, had voted for him in the past, had a relationship with him. We saw that in data and on independent expenditure side through Jobs Pack, we capitalized upon that and in our post-election analysis, we believe we drove about 18, 20 percent of the Republican vote to Daly. But we went and campaigned for it. Now, if, if left, if, if not touched or talked to, those voters may not convert. And again, they're not as likely to do it in June. It was new and they're partisan. In December, when the turnout expands and you get Republicans, Democrats, they're not as partisan. I think they're more likely to participate. But the Santa Monica assembly race, as Paul characterized it, it's all true, except that Republican voters and all voters have been told in that seat that Betsy Butler, the incumbent, on behalf of the Teachers Association, blocked a bill sponsored by a prominent LA Democrat that would allow teachers to immediately be fired when they are arrested for uh, sexual misconduct with students. And I think that's gonna motivate Republicans to vote against her. We'll see. I could be wrong, but I think that's the case. So the, the, you know, you, none of this happens in a vacuum. Campaigns still have to engage. And I'm, I'm pretty confident that in something like Berman Sherman, where all that money's being spent and there's a lot of con touch to those voters, they are realizing, I don't, I'm not sure they quite see it as UCLA versus UCLA. They, they get a real choice here about who's going to represent them. I mean, how many of us talk to our friends 
you know, at a, a dinner or at the cocktail hour and talk about our, a vote for president really doesn't matter in California because it's a foregone conclusion. And I just do think it gets more interesting for voters once they begin to learn that this isn't a foregone conclusion. It may be two people from the same squad that if I had my druthers, I really wouldn't vote for either one of them. But by the way, in June, I did get to vote for the guy from, from my party that had that opportunity. But these are the two finalists. And unlike elections in the past, I have a voice. I just think as, this, as we go forward in this decade, as campaigns now talk and campaign for those votes, um, that we'll see pretty healthy participation. Gary, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to you with another, with another question. Okay. You made a, a very persuasive case against the Republican Party in California. Now make an equally persuasive case on behalf of the California Democratic Party that controls the governor's office and state legislature. Well, you know my history. I mean, I, I'm as hard on my own party sometimes as I am on the Democratic Party. In fact, the former Democratic Speaker of the Assembly once publicly called me a Republican masquerading as a Democrat. Um, but, 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 you know, I want to put this in a business context because I think that's why you're all here. Um, I, I, I was a consultant to the California Chamber of Commerce um, back in the 2004-2005 um, period. And, you know, one, one, of, one of the reasons that I left, to be honest with you, was because what I found in amongst the many business groups that, that fund the Chamber PAC is that they weren't really dealing with the political realities on the ground in races where they wanted to get involved. I mean, if, if you're a business group, and I have a lot of business clients. I'm not a labor guy. I don't, I don't have labor clients. I'm, I'm, I consult mostly with corporations and business groups. Um, if you're looking long term, and I actually said this at the U.S. Chamber meeting in Las Vegas last week. If you're a business group, and I used to work for the National Association of Realtors in Washington, so I understand Republican-oriented business groups. If you're playing here in California politically, you can either bay at the moon and decry the fact that Democrats have complete across-the-board control of California government, or you can figure out ways, smart ways, to get involved in the political process that, that recognizes the reality of the overall democratic control of the state. I mean, if you, look, if you look at the district lines that were drawn, and Republicans made a huge issue out of the lines when the Citizens Commission put them forward, and in fact, Prop 40 on the ballot this, you know, in, in 18 days is, is an attempt by the Republicans to overturn the Senate lines. But let's look at the Senate for a moment. The, the, the Democrats have 25 members out of the 40-member Senate, okay? That's too short of a two-thirds majority, which would allow them to raise taxes without any Republican votes. My reading of the current situation in the Senate is the Democrats already have 27 votes. The Sam Blakesley seat, which is the 17th district out on the coast, Blakesley was so affected by the lines, he couldn't even run for re-election. Bill Monning is going to take that seat, okay? That's a turnover. They now have 26 seats. If you look at the 19th, which is in the Santa Barbara area, which is Hannah Beth Jackson, that's essentially sort of the western side of this Tony Strickland seat. And Tony Strickland decided not to run for the Senate again and is running for Congress. Hannah Beth Jackson is going to win that seat. That's a strongly Democratic seat. So now you have Blakesley out and Strickland out. Democrats have 27 votes, in my view. Unless Republicans can figure out a way they can take over two Democratic seats someplace, the Democrats already have two-thirds control in the Senate. Now, again, if you're a business group, you know, you can clap three times and try to bring Tinkerbell back to life, or you can deal with the reality that Democrats are going to have two-thirds control of the Senate, and my guess is by the time a couple of cycles go by, they'll have two-thirds control of the Assembly. If you look at the lines in the Assembly, as Paul well knows, 55 of the 80 seats, and this was not gerrymandered, the, the commission couldn't even under the law look at partisan registration when they drew these lines. Couldn't even calculate it. 55 of the 80 seats have a Democratic majority or plurality. Only 25 of the 80 seats have a Republican plurality or majority. Now, that doesn't mean the Democrats automatically get to 55 seats. But what it means is, is given 
the, the confluence of those lines with the demographic changes in California, with the growth of Latinos and Asian Americans, my, my estimation is that in a couple of cycles, Democrats will have a two-thirds majority in the assembly. So if you're a business organization and you think the Democrats are anti-business, what do you do? Give up? Well, no, you figure out smarter ways to deal with Democrats, to deal with moderate Democrats, and, and, and stop baying at the moon. I mean, that's, that's what you have to do. Uh, that's, that's free advice, but, but, but that's the way California is moving. And you have to deal with reality. As they say in golf, you have to play the ball as it lies. Uh, thank you, Gary. I'm going to come to Dick, and then we will open it up to questions from all of you. Uh, I asked, uh, I, I asked uh, uh, Gary Dick to uh, uh, present a, uh, an argument on behalf of the, of the Democratic Party. Clearly, the, the U.S. Chamber is not technically affiliated with the Republican Party, but you have weighed in very, very heavily uh, in a large number of Republican congressional and Senate races this year. Earlier this year, it looked like Republicans had a legitimate chance of taking over the U.S. Senate. Those chances appear to be shrinking. And while it still looks likely that Republicans will maintain control of the House of Representatives, it appears that will be by smaller margins than were being anticipated earlier this year. Does this, does this concern you? Does this concern the chamber? Well, it's, um, it's no secret that we are playing most heavily in Senate races and, um, and definitely with an eye of uh, reducing the authority of um, Majority Leader Harry Reid, who's not been a friend of ours or of business. Um, the odds of the uh, Senate being picked up by Republicans this year have diminished considerably. One of the reasons they were so good, by the way, as you know, one third of the Senate is up every two years. Uh, this is the 2006 class. And remember, 2006 was a very good year for Democrats. People were sick of George W. Bush. Some Republicans, myself included, were sick of George W. Bush, but he wasn't on the ballot. So Democrats won in an awful lot of places where they were unlikely winners, and as a result, it's 23 Democrats, 10 Republicans uh, seats that are uh, on the ballot this time. So just the math favored um, Republicans having a good year. Um, that has changed with the candidates. Uh, how do you spell Todd Aiken? Um, just throwing away seats. Uh, Missouri was a slam dunk for Republicans had any other candidate been nominated. Um, uh, there are other cases, um, Indiana comes to mind, where Republicans have made their, the, their um, situation uphill. Uh, that does concern us, but for the fact that 2014, two years from now, if the Republicans don't get it this time, they're likely to pick up one or two seats that they need. Right now, the balance is 53 Democrats, if you count the independents who caucus with them, to 47 Democrats. Um, if you'll recall, 2008 was also a rather good year for Democrats. As a result, in 2014, um, we will have 20 Democrats on the ballot and 13 Republicans. Now, that'll be the uh, sixth year of the Obama administration, maybe. And if it is, uh, boy, you can't think of a group with a bullseye on their back more so than those 20 Democrats who are up for re-election. Because just a guess, but if Obama isn't is, uh, finishing out his sixth year, my guess is he won't be all that popular at that point, And the voters will be looking for who to take it out on. So if the Republicans don't get it this time, their consolation is they're likely to in um, for 2014. As for the House, uh, um, it, yes, um, they probably are going to lose seats this time, but they hold a 25-seat net majority at the moment. Um, in California, redistricting was not kind to them, not intentionally, but that's how it worked out. And as a result, they will lose a couple of seats in California almost certainly. But if you'll recall, 2010 was a very good year for Republicans, and in particular, it was a good year in state houses. Um, and guess what? The uh, legislatures that were elected in 2010 were the ones that drew the state lines in most states. So Republicans have fared better there. Overall, they are likely to lose a few of the seats in their 25-seat majority, but most analysts, and we agree, um, and we've been working in a lot of cases to see to it, that those, uh, that those losses will be held to single digits. Um, in the House of Representatives, the way the rules work, if a party maintains uh, cohesion when they vote, often a difficult thing, 
But if they do, they can pass pretty much whatever they want out of the House of Representatives. So um, if they maintain a uh, you know, 10 to 15 seat majority in the House, they'll still be able to do what they want there. And we'll still have gridlock in the Senate no matter which party ends up in control. Um, don't know whether that helps, Dan, but um, uh, that's pretty much how it looks. Well, post-election, we will have to come back and talk about the prospects for gridlock or, uh, uh, or, or breaking thereof. We have, uh, we have 30 minutes left, and I've indulged myself long enough, so let's, uh, let, let's open this up and turn it into, uh, into a question period for all of you. Uh, so if you do have a question, uh, raise your hand, and I'll do my best to get to as many of you as possible. And I'll ask our panelists, with all the respect and deference in the world, uh, to offer relatively brief answers so we can get in as many questions as possible. Dick, why don't you take a shot at that one? Um, just, just briefly on the first comment, um, I was campaigning earlier this week in uh, Utah with a Democrat who we've supported for the last five elections, Jim Matheson. Uh, we have only backed five, uh, five Democrats in this election cycle. Uh, Jim Costa here in California we've backed as well. Uh, we backed 23 Democrats in the last election cycle. Uh, but as, and, and Ruben and I were talking about this at breakfast, um, the problem is, uh, most of the modern Democrats in Congress are gone. They were beaten. Uh, there aren't any more. And if you look at the numbers in here, I mean, I'd love, the U.S. Chamber would absolutely love to support more Democrats if they voted with us on business issues. But they don't. Um, the ones who are left, that, that has changed. It's gotten progressively harder for the Chamber if we're looking at business issues, and that's what we look at. How do they vote? Um, and if we look at business issues, the number of them that are there for the things that our members support have diminished. Uh, we wish there were more. We'd love to support more. We do not like being called an arm of the Republican Party, but they just aren't there. Um, so that's, uh, that's the answer to your, to, to your point. But the ones that are there, we will stand with them to the end. And as I said, I was in Utah earlier this week with Jim Matheson. Um, we love that guy. We love Jim Costa. We love the others. And we'd love to have a lot more of them. Other questions? Yes. Um, it's, a, it's a great question, and I'd like to give Paul the first shot at it, although it appears that uh, Gary and Rob would like to, to weigh in also. Um, Paul, this was an argument against congressional term limits, that it would put a particular state at, at, at a disadvantage. But I think a fascinating question, does a top two primary create a disadvantage for the state and Congress also? Well, 
First off, uh, on the results of, of these reforms actually making governing more less partisan, I don't think that redistricting will accomplish that. I don't think top two will accomplish that, but I do think potentially that the term limit extension will allow legislators a little bit more breathing room. I've never met an assembly candidate under the old system who did not know what Senate district he was going to run for. Mm -hmm. Never. <laughs> and it was almost like political malpractice to walk into an assembly seat and not be on campaign for your Senate seat in four or two or six years or whatever it's going to be. So that, that pressure might make for more rational lawmaking, but the results and the way the campaigns were run for the open primaries and the new districts didn't really seem to bear out moderation except in maybe one or two or three instances. In terms of uh, uniquely California uniquely disadvantaging its congressional delegation, the, the biggest impact on that would be redistricting because redistricting is what created the Berman Sherman less so than the open primary because if it was for the closed primary, Sherman would have won that and be facing the Republican candidate. So our voters through the creation of the redistricting commission understood that what they were doing was essentially anti-establishment. It was anti-incumbent. It was to try to break up the, the, you know, it was trying to shake up the end farming kind of you know, shake up who our representatives were, even in Congress, even to the detriment of a long-term member of Congress like uh, Dreyer, um, a long-term member of Congress like uh, potentially Berman or even Sherman. So um, I think that'll have more to do with the shakeup than the open primary itself. Gary? Um, the, I, I have been a long advocate of the open primary. I supported it when it was on the ballot in 1996. Um, I ran the only uh, gubernatorial campaign in California history so far with a candidate who came through the open primary, Gray Davis, in 1998, because that's the only one we ever had. And here's what I would tell you, and I actually put the open primary on the ballot in 2004 as Prop 62, uh, and then the legislature screwed around with it and put a diversionary measure on Prop 60, which, which ended up defeating Prop 62. So, I mean, I have some experience with this issue. Here's what I would tell you. It's going to take a couple cycles, I think, for candidates on both sides of the aisle to understand that in this kind of open primary process with the top two runoff, these are not separate elections, essentially. It's a continuum, okay? And every voter in the primary is in play. Unlike the old partisan primaries where Republicans couldn't vote for a Democrat, Democrats couldn't vote for a Republican, and minor party candidates, minor party uh, registrants could not vote for Democrats or Republicans, now the entire electorate is in play in the primary. That doesn't mean, I mean, clearly the turnout is lower in primaries, it just is. Um, but everyone potentially is in play. Everyone's in play who's in play in the general election. And what we did in 1998 was Dan Lundgren, who was the Republican nominee ultimately, didn't really understand in the primary that this was, this was not just something where you could sit there as a Republican and take all the traditional right-wing Republican positions, and our two Democratic opponents, who between them spent $60 million, decided to try to go to the left of us while we stayed in the middle, okay? And one thing we found was that, yes, independent or nonpartisan or decline to state turnout is generally low in a primary, but one thing we found in 1998 was that of those independent voters who voted, in the primary with three Democrats and one Republican, they voted 70% for one of the Democrats and only 21% for Dan Lundgren. In the general election, in the two-way, we got 68% of independents and Lundgren only got 28%. Not exactly the same voters, clearly, but what we found was that if you get independent voters, if you get crossover voters to go with you in the primary, they tend to stick with you in the general election. That's the lesson that candidates on both sides are going to have to learn Play the open about primary. I think it's a good thing. And the reality is, I mean, I live in Santa Monica. I'm in that Senate district with Betsy Butler and, and, and Richard Bloom. I mean, you, you, there could be a Republican on the ballot there and make Republicans feel good voting for him, but that Republican has no shot whatsoever of winning in the general election. I mean, that Republican would get 21, 27 percent of the vote. So the only way that anyone's going to have a choice in that district is if you have two Democrats, both of whom are viable and it's a close race, and, and Republicans and independent voters are going to be the balance of power there, just like they are in the 30th Congressional District over here in the Valley. Thank you, Gary. Other, uh, uh, other questions? Yes.
Let's uh, let's let's go to Rob and then to Paul. And I guess the, the way I hear the question, and it's an excellent one, Rob, is: Does Prop 29 make legislators more or less responsive? It's a it's a it's a. <laughs> I like the way you said it. Um, it. It's a great question. I think what we I mean I think what a lot of us hope the virtue of that reform will be will be a, to allow for longer serving leadership, particularly as speaker. Yeah. We've had a series. The current system weakens speakers because as soon as they come into power, they're already talking about who you know who's going to replace them because their tenure is so short. Uh, governance: the House is just better served by a longer-serving speaker and have someone that has more power, uh, so that so that governance can happen. To your the answer I would have though to your question, which I think is is valid. I understand your point that you like that leverage as they're looking ahead to the Senate race, well, is to make the reelect matter. And again, I go back to this Butler-Bloom race, and there's one in Marin County where Michael Allen's the incumbent under siege by a very good local candidate, Mark Levine, is, you know, organizations, um, and, and this gets to the point Gary's talking about, business groups I think are seeing the, the reality that lies ahead of them, need to make these elections matter even if it's because you now have the opportunity to do it intra-party. And, uh, you know, I mean, if Betsy Butler loses, there may be a lot of um, liberal Democrats who take on anti-business causes that might want to think long and hard because maybe their number comes up in two years and the business groups are going to concentrate on them. I think you'll see business organizations pretty much decide we're going to toe tag one of these guys every cycle. And if that is hanging out there, um, that the potential to do that, you don't want your number to come up. You'd rather have that not happen. So I think it'll affect behavior and how they vote. I mean, if Butler loses and the narrative is, is because you know she did this awful thing for for uh, for the teachers union um, over the interest of what common sense and constituency, I think people are going to think long and hard before they just do whatever the unions ask them to do in that instance. So. Make it matter. I mean, we have new rules, so we got to just find the opportunity to make sure elections uh, still matter. I, I think Rob's totally right. What, one of the interesting things about the Butler race is it is a test for the leadership and the speaker. Yeah. Um, they've put millions of dollars into making sure that the incumbent, not just the Democrat, but the incumbent wins in that district and a district up in Marin. It makes no sense. Democrats are taking money out of Hanford and Bakersfield in competitive races where they want to win against a Republican and putting that money in Santa Monica and Marin. And I can't imagine there has been a time in this century or last century where Democrats had to spend money in Santa Monica to win a general election. So the, the problem is, is if Butler loses, the leadership, the speaker's strength diminishes because incumbents need to know that when they're in the in the arms of the speaker and the leadership that they will win their general elections. They will be able to stave off any challenge in those 12 years from somebody of their own party. The 12-year thing is interesting because in one way it gives members, these new members, a lot of breathing room. They've got 12 years, they're serving with a bunch of people who have four or two years left in their terms. So it's going to be a very unequal balance of power between those two. It's also a huge class that's coming in that's going to have the 12 years. But there's also the psychology that's existed in elections for the last you know, if, since term limits was, was created, where if I'm really up and comer in Glendale and I look at the 43rd Assembly District, I'm like, well, it's going to be open in two or four years anyway, so I'm going to wait. Now, if I'm not up and comer in Glendale and I've got to wait 10 years, maybe I'm going to challenge that incumbent. We haven't seen a lot of really good, strong challenges in these races, in part because the candidate from San Diego knows, well, Marty Block's going to term out in two years so I'll, or four years, so I'll wait till the next election cycle. That waiting might not happen. You might have people coming in and trying to use the open primary to take away some seats. So a lot of it is to be seen. Other questions? Yes, Jill. 
Uh, I'm Jill Barad, I'm a political consultant in Los Angeles, and um, the pundits are saying that this presidential election will be one of the closest in history. And with this esteemed panel, I'd like to know your prediction. Who do you think wins? The question was a prediction for an outcome on the presidential campaign, and what I'm going to do to make an impossible job even more difficult for a panel is to say, we're not looking for explanations, guys. We're simply looking for predictions. Okay. Romney, Obama. Um, now, me, I'm horrible at predictions. I thought that USC's football team was going to go undefeated this year. <laughs> I thought that the Dodgers, after getting Adrian Gonzalez, were a lock for the World Series. I thought Bristol Palin was going to win Dancing with the Stars. So I am pulling off. So I am pulling off of this one. Um, Rob, prediction. I think uh, Romney's going to win, and he'll get 52 percent of the of the vote. Okay. Gary, you agree? I'm guessing. Obama will. He got 365 electoral votes last time, 95 more than he needed. You need 270. Do the math. Look at how many states he can lose that he carried in, in 2008 and still be elected president. He's ahead as of today in Ohio, in Wisconsin, in Iowa. That's the ball game. He can lose every other state that's in play and still get to 270. Romney has a very difficult path to get to 270. I'm horrible at predictions. I still think that Lance Armstrong won seven tours to France, so <laughs> I, I have no idea what's happening. Um, but, uh, you know, the, I, I think Gary's right that some of the swing states are states that Obama has a healthy advantage in, but the, the shift from that uh, first debate was stronger than anybody expected, so I don't think anybody really, really knows. Romney wins the popular vote, Obama wins the Electoral College. That's like that's oh, oh, wow. <laughs> And what I will say, being the prediction wimp that I am, is for those of you who watch these things closely, uh, you know that it, the, an election this close comes down to very specific groups of swing voters. And as is the case in most recent presidential election, that particularly critical group of swing voters in this election are married women. If married women, as Mitt Romney would like, vote on the economy, then Romney is elected president. If the majority of married women vote instead on a broader range of social and cultural and in particular women's health issues, then that's Obama's ticket to re-election. It's a wimpy prediction, admittedly, but if you look at the voting priorities of that key swing group, that, that, uh, uh, that tells you who wins going in. Anyone have an easier question than Jill's? The married women uh, are a, if not the, key swing group. And the, by the way, are there any married women in this room? Okay, that's more than I get at US. That's more than I get at USC. Um, but if you assume, as I do, that married women are the a, a, a or the key swing group in this election, the issue on which they base their vote ultimately determines the outcome. And if you watch the debates, if you watch the conventions, if you watch the ads, Romney's working very hard to convince them to vote their bank account. Obama's attempting to make the election for them about a broader range of issues, social, cultural, and in particular, women's health. Precisely. <laughs> yes, sir. Gary, do you have any thoughts on this? I do. I'll tell you the same thing I told the U.S. Chamber last week in Vegas. And again, I mean, I'm mostly a business consultant. I'm not somebody who is an operative for organized labor. But let me tell you the reality, okay? If you're a Democrat, I mean, my, my complaint about business groups is that they do in politics what they complain that the government does in governing, which is throw money at a problem. Business puts money into politics, but they don't put boots on the ground. That's the problem, okay? If I'm a Democrat, and I've got chamber pack coming in supporting me, and I have to choose between whether or not I'm going to tilt to business or tilt to labor, and I have 2,000 volunteers coming into my campaign from SEIU and AFSCME and CTA and all these other groups, who am I going to choose, folks? I mean, you don't, you don't have... You know, the Bankers Association may throw money into politics, but have you ever seen a big bank president from Wells Fargo come knock on your door the weekend before the election campaigning for a candidate? Business groups just throw money at the problem. Well, let's put some ads on, do some mailers, throw in millions of dollars of ads, throw in millions of dollars of ads. And, and at the end of the day, Democrats have to make a very pragmatic decision about who really wins their races. And that happens to be, in most cases, labor, because not only does labor have the money, 
Labor has the shock troops. Labor puts the boots on the ground. And business doesn't do that. Now, I don't know how business does, how business uh, uh, compensates for that. But that's just a reality when you're on the, on the Democratic side that, that Democrats have to take into account. If you have to alienate the chamber versus alienating SEIU and you're a Democrat, which one do you think you're going to choose? It's not just about the money. It's about the boots on the ground. Gary, thank you very much. We're going to let Dick talk for just a minute or two on this and then try to work in one more question. I think Gary's very um, eloquently stated why Democratic office holders are more responsive to labor than they are to business arguments, but I don't know that that necessarily applies to, um, uh, to the electorate as a whole. Um, you're right that, bu that business mostly throws money at things, but they're throwing a hell of a lot more at it now than they were in the past, and I expect that to continue. I think th uh, that the b business groups are becoming increasingly energized by the effects that government policy have on their businesses, and um, they're showing it with their wallets. Some of them are showing it by showing up at, uh, say, um, uh, polling, uh, excuse me, um, um, uh, phone banks and precinct walks, but uh, but they're, they are getting more engaged. Um, so we'll see how this plays out over time, but I um, totally agree with Gary's analysis as to why Democratic office holders are very responsive to uh, unions' concerns. We are, yes sir. Paul, why don't, uh, for, those of you who didn't, for those of you who didn't hear Dave's question, uh, first he congratulated our panelists on the brilliance of their presentations. He said they were absolutely fascinating and that he was riveted by every word. And guys, I know it's a little bit embarrassing, and Dave, I think they wish he hadn't done that. But going further, uh, the question was about redistricting. And Paul, maybe you can give us a brief overview of the process and, and yes. how it came together. So redistricting in the state of California is done by an independent commission. Um, really an experiment uh, for this state and one that I think will be copied by a lot of other states in 10 years and will also happen a lot more in local government. Um, obviously the requirement in redistricting is population equality. In districts like the Burma, there's this other Voting Rights Act issue where if there is an ability to create a district that's more than 50 percent of one ethnicity, a minority district, and that ethnicity has a problem getting candidates elected if they don't have a majority, which is true for Latinos in LA, then they had to create a very strong Latino seat. Berman and Sherman used to overlap and kind of dilute the Latino population in, in these two seats. When they created a strong Latino seat and the remainder, which is now the Berman Sherman seat, that created the Berman Sherman duel. So redistricting is done in California on an independent basis, independent commission following federal laws, keep districts equal size, not looking at partisanship, not looking at incumbents, and this in part was the result. And one quick shout out for VICA in this is that VICA saw the commission process as being a huge opportunity to empower the Valley. And more so than almost any other group in the state, they came forward to this pro public process with maps and arguments and, and testimony. And VICO and the Valley were huge winners in this process in a way that would not have been achieved in the old rules where the governor and the legislature sat down, traded votes for bills over district lines. And on that point, unlike the previous one, Paul and I are in complete agreement. You as individuals and as an organization deserve a huge amount of credit, not just by the way, uh, for the way that you work through the redistricting process, but for your support for those reforms in the, uh, uh, when they appeared on, on the ballot originally. Uh, uh, each of you deserves a, a huge amount of credit and gratitude for the, for the work that you've done. We're now going to enter the shallow and superficial portion of our program. And what I'm going to do, given our, our lack of time, is I'm going to ask our panelists to simply tell us win or lose in answer to questions about a series of ballot initiatives that I know we're all paying a great deal of attention to this year. Guys, unfortunately, there's not time for considered uh, brilliant analysis. But so what we just need now is a win or lose answer on each of, on, on each of these initiatives. So we'll start with uh, uh, Proposition 34. 
which would eliminate the death penalty in California. Rob, does it pass or not? Lose. Lose. Gary? Lose. Paul? I'm out. Okay, you I don't care. I can't predict. I'm working. Our, our work does okay. work with both sides of the measure. Okay. Lose. Lose. Okay. Prop 36, three strikes. Rob? Passes. Passes. You, you in this one too, Paul? I'm out of all of Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be right. Passes says, says Dick. Uh, Position 37, genetically modified foods. Rob? Fails. Gary? Fails. Fail. Okay. Paul, write it down and we'll read it after the election. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. okay. Dick? Don't know, hope it fails. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Proposition 32, campaign. Uh, we'll start with Dick. Fails. Fails. Gary? Fails and should fail. Rob? Fails. Fails. Um, all right, well, I guess that's it for key. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Propositions 30 and 38, pass or fail. Dick? Fail, fail. Both fail. Gary? Fail, fail. Both fail. Rob? Fail, fail. Wow. wow. <laughs> all right. For those of you who are sitting writing down their predictions so you can rub these guys' noses in it if you disagree with anything they said, what I'll do then is I will I'll ask the broader room this. Um, on, this is not a matter of preference, it's a matter of prediction. How many people in the room agree with the analysts on Proposition 30? How many people in this room think Proposition 30 will pass? 30 will pass? Will pass. How many people think Proposition 30 will pass? One, two, three, three and a half, three quarters, four and a half, five, six, seven, eight. How many people think Prop 30 will be defeated? Okay. Wow. You guys are very persuasive. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, uh, Unfortunately, and there's, uh, there's, there are literally dozens of other questions we could this panel and I think would uh, d certainly enjoy and benefit from the analysis they'd provide. But I promised Stuart that we would not turn this into a telethon. And so unfortunately, this is all the time we have for this panel. So I'd once again like to take our panel sponsor, NBC Universal, as well as our runway sponsor, Southwest Airlines and Verizon. Please give our sponsors a round of applause.